This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with Costas Georgis, reader in sports psychology from Brunel University and author of the new book, Applying Music in Exercise and Sport. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Costas Georgis from Brunel University. Costas has conducted a wide body of fascinating research examining how music affects performance in sports and exercise. He has also worked directly with a lot of organizations, including England Rugby, Red Bull, and British Athletics. In the interview, we discuss how music can make athletes perform better and for longer, how music affects an athlete's attentional focus and perceived effort, how to choose the best music for a particular sport or activity, when not to use music, and how teams can use music to improve their performance. Hope you enjoy! Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Okay, today my guest is Costas Georgis, reader in sports psychology at Brunel University in the UK and author of the new book, Applying Music and Exercise in Sports. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Costas. It's a great pleasure, Rob. Pleasure to be with you. Great. And so to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in sports and exercise science? I guess it all stems from my time as a child. I grew up in a poor but rather colorful enclave of South London. And the flat in which I resided with my parents and extended family was located immediately above a second-hand record store. And so every morning I'd be jolted out of bed by this thundering subwoofer from uh, the shop beneath. And I'd look out of the window, wipe my sleepy eyes, and notice that as people came within earshot of the music, it would put a, a lilt in their step, their physiognomy and their facial expressions would change and the music functioned as a, an auditory backdrop for everything that I saw in my environment. So from a very young age I began to become interested in how music affected the human psyche uh, and the human condition uh, and as well as listening to a lot of Bob Marley and Desmond Decker during my early years I went on to develop quite an interest in the composition of music and the performance of music uh, and generally the appreciation of music. At the same time uh, as having that interest in music, I developed quite a strong interest in track and field and my uh, school teachers directed me towards a coach at the Crystal Palace National Sports Centre, which was fairly close to where I lived at the time. And I think that the sport and music took place quite separately in those early years but as I grew older and I went to university, the two fields of sports and music came together. They converged. And it was at university that I began to conduct my first formal research into how music affected the human psyche and human functioning. It really all stemmed from those early years. Oh, that's a really interesting story. Yeah, that's so very young. You kind of are making observations. Yeah. Um, so I know you've done, you know, a really wide range of studies on the, the effects of music and we all, everyone's probably experienced the kind of uplift you can get getting you through a tough workout. But can you talk a bit more specifically about some of the psychological and physiological effects you found in your research? Sure. Most of my research over the last 20, 25 years has been centered on the psychological and psychophysiological effects of music. Uh, and so this has been a key focus. I guess if I had to summate some of the main findings, uh, one of the most consistent things to come out in my research and subsequently in research from other groups from around the world is that well-selected music has a strong influence on the affective or the, the mood-related regions of the brain. Uh, and it was theorized that when you work out or when you train at a relatively high intensity, so let's say 
beyond the anaerobic threshold, which is the point at which we experience breathlessness, acidosis in the muscles, and exercise really becomes quite labored and difficult. It was thought that external influences such as music were relatively ineffectual. And I think one of the main contributions of my body of work is that we've quantified the benefits of music at these high intensities and also showed some of the underlying brain mechanisms that account for the affective benefits of music. So music, well-selected music in particular, can influence how we feel at a range of intensities, all the way from a very low intensity when we're walking in the local park to going all out on a treadmill close to our aerobic capacity. Music appears to have a positive influence on our affective state. Interestingly, when we look at psychophysical responses to music or how hard we think we're working, it seems that music can moderate the psychophysical responses at a low to moderate intensity, but it doesn't seem to do so at high intensities. This shows that coupled with the affective benefits, although music can't influence what we feel at a high intensity, it can influence how we feel it. It colors the uh, fatigue-related symptoms that we experience during exercise and can make the whole experience more pleasurable and more tolerable. Now, I think from a practical perspective, this is very salient because when we examine people's adherence levels and their adherence patterns and the reasons that they give for not adhering to habitual physical activity, it seems that the unpleasantness that they experience and the negative sensations associated with high impact exercise in particular dissuades them from the repeated practice of exercise. So my body of work has shown that as well as making high intensity exercise more pleasurable, there's also what we've termed an attentional shift. And this means that the point at which dissociation or focusing outwardly crosses into association or focusing in inwardly, the point at which that happens is shifted by about 10%. So you can work harder for longer and it seems more tolerable with well-selected music than when you're not selecting music. Now, all of this may sound a little scientific and complex, but the bottom line is that music can give you more staying power and it makes exercise seem easier because it makes you dissociate or focus outwardly rather than on the internal sensations of fatigue, uh, such as the deep breathing, the muscular pain, the acidosis that you experience in the, in the musculature, etc. Makes it seem easier, makes it more tolerable. Bottom line is that people who find it difficult to tolerate and to stick to exercise are more likely to do so with a well-selected music program another area that we've been looking at experimentally uh, and that is the synchronous application of music where we consciously synchronize our movements to the rhythmical qualities of music and in this realm it appears that with people who are recreationally active the music can increase their work rate by 10 to 15 percent and it can increase their endurance now as well as increasing their endurance through this synchronization or entrainment effect, you get a triple whammy because it enhances their mood and it lowers their perception of effort. Mm -hmm. So there's something unique that comes in terms of the benefits derived from syncing our movements to music uh, that is very powerful indeed. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I was really interested in the, the attentional side of things because that's kind of one of the things that I look at too is so is it just the case that music gives you kind of an external thing you can hold on to lo a bit longer so you, you to keep you from, you know, focusing inwards on your, you know, the pain you're feeling or the discomfort? Well, Rob, what happens is that when we get up toward high intensities, when we go, say, beyond 70% of our aerobic capacity 
and you experience breathlessness and perspiration and pain in the muscles. Our brain is programmed to switch automatically. There's an automatic switch from external stimuli such as a pleasant environment in which we might be or a conversation we're engaged in or a musical stimulus. It switches from those external influences to internal fatigue-related symptoms. So we're forced to focus on our burning lungs or our beating heart. And this, if you like, is a type of protection mechanism. It, pr it protects us from overexerting and doing some critical damage. So it's a good thing. But there is a little bit of leeway wherein if our attention p can be dis distracted and thrown more towards external stimuli, so if we're in a very pleasant environment or we have an engaging video or a documentary to distract us or a piece of music, it means that the point at which we switch from dissociation to association is extended and we're able to work a little bit longer, a little bit harder, and the whole experience is more tolerable, as I say. Yeah. So that's essentially how it works. It gives us an alternative frame, an alternative place where we can focus our attention. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I, I noticed you used the phrase a few times, well-chosen music. So there's a couple of things that kind of popped to mind for me is, one is, I guess, you know, genre. So is there particular genres that are better or is it more important that you match it to your personal preferences? It's funny, Rob, but ev virtually everyone who's interviewed me on this topic has asked, which is the best genre, <laughs> which is the best piece of music? It's a little bit of a holy grail, this. There's no best genre or best piece yeah. of music. I didn't think um, there was. <laughs> but music is a very, <laughs> is a very personal a cultural phenomenon. Roman philosopher Lucretius famously said that one man's meat is another man's poison. Uh, and if we translate that into modern day parlance, one person's noise is another person's music. And so a piece that will be effective, motivational, distractive for one person may not be for another. Uh, and so it's a very personal thing. But interestingly, when it comes to the rating of perceived exertion and our psychophysical responses to music, it seems that even very middle of the road and, and not personally selected pieces can reduce perceived exertion, albeit that the degree of benefit is not as great as when the music is selected with a host of factors taken into consideration. So yeah, when it comes to just pure and simple distraction, any piece of music can do the trick. But if you can get into people's uh, music libraries, their musical predilections, think about the kind of activity that they're engaged in, the intensity of that activity, and get the mix of music, person, mode of activity, and intensity of activity just right, then you begin to derive some quite significant benefits from the music. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I figured that would be, you know, a personal preference, you know, mix of factors, right? The, the other one I was thinking of was the kind of the quality of music, and a particular one I've seen focused on a lot is, is beats per minute. Um, you know, I'm a runner, so I've seen a lot of uh, playlists of, you know, 180 beat per minute music to try to get your, your cadence up. How important is that a factor, and it, does it depend on the, the activity you're doing? Yeah, if you're looking to synchronize your movement to the music. The BPM is critical because that will determine your work rate. And you gave the example of running with 180 steps per minute tied into a piece that's 180 BPM. It works just as well or even better in some instances when you take a piece of music that's rhythmically busy at 90 BPM because processing a piece that, that's at 100 80 BPM is really tough. So if, for example, you take much of the music in the rap genre, which is between 75 and 95 BPM, and then take a whole stride cycle per beat, it works really well when you want to sync your uh, running stride to it. A few things that I'd like to add in regard to syncing your movements to music. If you use highly syncopated or rhythmically unpredictable music, say 
music from the Latin genre, such as samba, mumbo, uh, salsa. For some people from Western cultures, it's very difficult to sync to syncopated or highly syncopated pieces of music. Also, if you listen to progressive rock, which often speeds up and slows down, again, if you're looking to create a steady pattern of movement, uh, using music from those genres makes it difficult. So think about the rhythmical nature of the music, its rhythmical qualities, the degree to which you're able to sync to it in order to maximize the experience. Just to put it into perspective, if you think of pieces like uh, Maz Kanada by George Ben, Get on the Good Foot by James Brown, or Superstition by Stevie Wonder, these are highly syncopated rhythms. So it's relatively difficult to sync your movements to them. Mm-hmm. But if you take pieces like Firework by Katy Perry, uh, Sweat by Snoop Dogg versus David Guetta, or uh, Of the Night by Bastille. These are pieces that are relatively steady and unsyncopated, and so it's easy for an athlete, a runner, an exerciser to sync their movements to them. Okay. So do you suggest maybe switching between them, like sometimes using very easy ones to sync and sometimes using more complex ones? Would there be any advantage to doing that? There's no advantage to using highly syncopated music, particularly when you want to tie in your movements to a very steady rhythm. If you're from, for example, if you're from a Latin American background, you've grown up with that music and you're accustomed to the syncopated rhythms, then that can work very well for you. So, you know, I'm not saying that nobody can use highly syncopated rhythms. It depends on your cultural background and your musical predilections. But for... Joe and Josephine Public in the US, in the UK, who are not particularly in tune with Latin music or highly syncopated rhythms, and thinking about genres that are fairly steady, such as bubblegum pop or rock music, dance, UK garage, these are all genres that are relatively easy to sync your movements to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I've... Long-time listeners of this podcast, will, I've talked about my attempts to do a salsa dancing course, so <laughs> I know the this firsthand. Yes. Okay. Moving a bit from uh, from away from the research side, uh, I noticed you've done a lot of work up trying applying the, your work, um, working with sports teams and y- musicians, and I noticed mm-hmm. you even work with Nike on some music technology. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about kind of the work you've been doing on that side of things? Sure. Many of the projects that I've been involved in. Uh, have entailed coming up with either bespoke tracks or specialized music programs for individuals or for organizations or to sync with particular activities. For example, uh, one of the best known projects was with the former World Commonwealth and European 400 meter hurdles champion, Di Green, uh, in preparation for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, I got a phone call out of the blue from his management and they wanted to give Dai a little pick me up. He'd had surgery and, and really they wanted to trigger something that would increase his motivation and help him in his preparation for the London 2012 games. And they had the idea of coming up with a, a bespoke, a specialized piece of music for him. And so what they did, they connected me with Dai's favorite producer and DJ, Red Light. He's a a British artist. And we were charged with coming up with a track that Dai would use in the competitions in the lead into the Olympic Games, but also at the Olympic Games. So yeah, this was quite a challenge because normally in such instances, you would work on an athlete's music library and then come up with a a music program that would engender the the right kind of mindset. But in this instance, it was about creating a new piece of music. And the project was broken up into three phases. In the first phase, uh, I engaged in a process of psychological screening of Di Green, find out what it is that makes him tick. And I also had a very close look at his music library 
it, it had a, a particular urban flavor with American artists such as Snoop Dogg, Jay-Z, uh, Tupac Shakur at the fore. And we talked about the kind of music that he listened to so that I had a clear idea of what was in his musical DNA. In those crucial minutes before the call-up at major track and field championships, it's critical that the music brings about the desired mindset. So armed with all of that information, I began working with Red Light, the producer DJ in the studio. And this was in the spring of 2012. Uh, and we came up with um, a skeleton of a track, predominantly with a bass line and a rhythm track. And uh, we actually got Di into the studio and he fed back to us and we were able to incorporate his feedback into the creative process. And a, a few days later, Di got the fledgling track, he began to use it and he was really enthused by it. Uh, and then Red Light put the finishing touches. There was quite a, uh, a lot of media interest over it. We actually ended up appearing on, on the BBC News. Uh, and the track was titled Talk to the Drum. Di used it in preparation for the London 2012 Games and actually uh, achieved a personal best performance over 400 meter hurdles while uh, using it. That was in Paris, where he ran a time of 47.84 seconds. And he used it all the way through to the Olympic Games, where he made the final of the 400 meter hurdles and also participated in the 4x400 meter relay. He was the Team GB track and field captain at the Games. Unfortunately, he didn't have it all his own way at the Games. And the injuries that he'd had, the little niggles and uh, the surgery earlier on in, in the year took their toll. Uh, and Di came fourth in the individual 400-meter hurdles and also fourth with his team in the 4x400-meter hurdles. But what was interesting was that this was a whole new approach to the use of music and the application of music as an ergogenic aid in sport, to work with an artist and take a scientific approach, to come up with a track that had all of the right ingredients and the right sonic mix in order to engender the optimal mindset in a world-class athlete. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, you know, getting a, one specially made for you. I um, also wonder, you know, it made me think, I don't know if this is something you've looked at in your research. How how important is kind of the novelty of, of a song? You know, everyone has their favorites that they probably have on their playlist. But sometimes when you hear a song that's, you know, new or you haven't heard in a while, it seems to me subjectively to have a bit more of an effect. Have you noticed anything like that? Well, it's a great question that you've asked. And this is something that we have researched and indeed something that's been of great interest in mainstream psychomusicology. And we know that from repeated exposure to a piece of music, you will often like it more and more unless you detest it from the outset. But after you've been exposed to it for a number of times, your degree of liking will reduce and you'll, you'll begin to hate the piece <laughs> as you're repeatedly exposed to it. I mean, if I hear Cotton Eye Joe another time, I will go and bang my head against the wall. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, if it's a piece of music that you really connect with, that perhaps is from an artist, a genre has a rhythmic style that you really enjoy. In those first few times that you listen to it, it can have a very powerful and potent effect. And if you do find tracks like that, they're really to be, to be savored and to be brought out for those really important occasions. So for me, it was a kind of magic by Queen. There was something truly magical about that track. And when I was competing in track and field, I would incorporate that as part and parcel of my pre-event routine. So, yes, it is the case that there's a novelty effect and that when you connect with a piece of music early on and it has a strong effect, take advantage of that. But also be wary of the desensitization effect, which comes from repeated exposure, where the influence of a previously potent piece of music wanes with repeated or excessive exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting issue. I always try to make a special <laughs> playlist that I don't listen to beforehand when it, when it races coming up or something. But 
Yeah, I noticed in you know the outline for your book, you have kind of specific uh, case studies for different sports and uh, the how to use music for for different types of sports. I was wondering, you know, is there what are kind of the differences between applying music in team versus individual sports? In an individual sport, you can cater solely for that individual, what makes them tick, the specifics of their pre-event routine, their goals, challenges, aspirations. You can make the piece of music or the program of music truly bespoke, but in a team situation, you have to cater for many different personalities. If you're working, say, in the English Premiership with a team like Chelsea, you might have 10 or 11 different nationalities to cater for. So it becomes really complex. And so in the team situation, it's really about enhancing the esprit de corps and finding something that serves as a social gel and brings the the players together. If I could share an example with you, Mm -hmm. other than track and field, one of my favorite sports is rugby union. Uh, It's a sport that's very popular in the British Commonwealth. And Anthemic chanting is part and parcel of the experience in rugby union. It's a source of inspiration for the players and for the fans. Uh, And it allows fans to express their appreciation or often (laughs) their disdain Mm -hmm. for whatever is happening on the field of play. Now, most of the great rugby teams and indeed soccer teams also have uh, a distinctive chance that will reverberate from the stands. For the England rugby union team, uh, it's the rousing African-American spiritual swing low sweet chariot. Now, nowadays, I, I live in almost in the shadow of Twickenham rugby ground. So uh, this is a piece of music that particularly resonates with me because I hear it very re- loudly uh, whenever it's a, a match day at Twickenham. Now, Although perhaps an unlikely choice for the uh, England faithful, given that the hymn can be traced back to the blight of slavery, it was spontaneously adopted in March 1988 when England were were playing Ireland. Uh, And when Chris Oti, a black player, scored a a sensational hat-trick. So nowadays, the singing of Swing Low Sweet Chariot, whether in the stands or in the players' locker room before the match, promotes strong feelings of patriotism, togetherness, pride. It has taken on a a new and entirely different meaning and significance through the medium of association. And often this happens in sport where a piece of music will be taken from another context and brought to bear in the hotbed of competition where it takes on new significance. Another great example is uh, You'll Never Walk Alone, which reverberates at Liverpool FC, mm-hmm. uh, which is, of course, a song from the 60s, popular, popularized by Jerry and the Pacemakers. It can still be heard today, and anyone who's associated with Liverpool Football Club will hear that anthem, and the hairs on the back of their neck will, mm-hmm. will prick up. It has the effect of what we call pilo erection, raising the hairs. Mm -hmm. So in an individual scenario, it's about the needs of the individual and catering for those very specifically. In the team scenario, it's about finding whatever will make the team come together, what will enhance cohesion, what will make the team hold a common identity. And that uh, example of Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which is a, a hymn from way back, is a great example from England Rugby. Yeah, no, I think I can think of some examples like that here. Yeah, that's that's what you do, right? They become associated with a certain team or certain event. I guess the the last question I have for you, you know, I was, I was mentioning I was a runner and, you know, I'm always debating whether to take my earbuds and, and kind of tune out or I should whether I should leave them at home and kind of try to focus more on what's going on in the moment. Do you think, you know, can you talk about a little bit about the kind of the balance between using music and not using it? Yeah, there is a balance to be had. And and actually, there's an interesting debate that I had with a sports sociologist, Jim Dennison, which is uh, presented in my book, Applying Music and Exercise in Sport, Mm -hmm. uh, in case any of your listeners are interested, in which we 
tease out the pros and cons of running with music. So I argued for the use of music and Jim argued against the use of music. And in terms of striking that balance, there is a lot to be said for tuning into your body, regulating your movements, being at one with your environment, uh, and having a flow experience that doesn't involve any, any form of external stimulation. If you think about our modern lives, Rob, we're perpetually disturbed by the ping of emails, the blaring of music wherever we go, music and video, people trying to sell us things. I mean, there's a lot of noise just in our everyday modern living environment. So getting away from that through running and perhaps being immersed in nature, reflecting on our own thoughts and enjoying just being in the moment is actually a very precious thing. So for people particularly who find it easy to focus inwardly and to reflect in that nature, music might be an unwanted distraction. But many people find that it's hard to engage in a habitual program of running or exercise without some form of rhythmic or musical stimulation. And for them, music can be a very powerful stimulus. Now, in your case, are you a recreational runner, Rob, or a serious runner? Uh, pretty much recreational, yeah. <laughs> well, in your case, what I would recommend, if you enjoy listening to music while running, is to try having two sessions with music to one session without. That's a perfect balance in terms of maximizing the effects that you're likely to derive from music. And I would add that you should seek to churn the music or change your playlist every two weeks or so to keep things fresh. Because if you listen to the same music over and over again, it will, it will become tiresome and boring and you're unlikely to derive the same benefit from it as when you churn your music and perhaps include some new tunes, maybe some tunes from the current charts, as well as some of those uh, old classics that you enjoy from the 80s and 90s. Yeah, no, that's great. That's uh, good advice. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to try that. <laughs> so your book, as you mentioned, is Applying Music and Exercise in Sport. And is it it's coming out this month or is it out already? Uh, the book is uh, out this week okay. in the US. And it's Human Kinetics, um, I, right? I understand that it should be available in the UK uh, next week, so towards mid-September. Uh, it's published by Human Kinetics, who also published my first book, Inside Sports Psychology. Okay. I'm very excited about the uh, launch of the book. There will be a launch event on the 28th of September in uh, Beckenham mm -hmm. in South London. Uh, and if any UK uh, listeners are, are tuned into this podcast, they're very welcome to come along to that and they can find details on the uh, British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences website, the BASE's website. Uh, there will be a series of events alongside the launch of the book that will entail media-related engagements, podcasts, a webinar, uh, various invited talks. So if people are interested in this field of scientific endeavor, it shouldn't be too hard to find the book and to find related events. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So I think it's a really fascinating topic. So, so that's great, Costas. Thank you for taking some time to talk with me. Uh, it's been a, a great pleasure uh, talking with you, Rob. And uh, I wish you every success in your running and musical endeavors. Thanks again for the great discussion, Costas. I'm working on my new running playlist as we speak, and I'm really looking forward to learning more from your book. You can order Applying Music and Exercise and Sport and help this podcast at the same time by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash recommended or by using the link in the show notes. Coming soon on the Perception and Action podcast, a look at the effect of stereotype threat on performance. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. Cut you quick. Tears will linger